Hello everyone, I'm Blake Tedder, the Communications and Engagement Coordinator with Duke Forest Teaching and Research Lab at Duke University. This is the second video in a new series uh, from the Office of the Duke Forest called Ask a Scientist. Our goal is to engage our community with science and introduce you to some of our researchers. The questions we will ask our scientists are for non-scientists submitted by you, non-scientists, and asked by me, a true non-scientist. So. Um, it should be interesting for all audiences. Find out more about the Duke Forest at dukeforest.duke.edu or by signing up for our newsletter or are following us on social media. Today, we're so excited to have Dr. Rebecca Rimbach. Dr. Rimbach is a postdoctoral associate in the Department of Evolutionary Anthropology at Duke University. She is an ecophysiologist and interested in how animals respond to natural and anthropogenic or human cause changes in their environment. She aims to understand which physiological and behavioral responses enable animals to adapt to changes in their environment and the consequences of uh, these responses for health, survival, and fitness. She is a German citizen and lived and studied in uh, small rodents for many years in South Africa. Dr. Rimbach came to Duke in 2019 and is launching a project studying the impact of urban life on eastern gray squirrels in the Duke Forest. So we are excited to talk to her uh, today. Dr. Rimbach, welcome and um, glad to have you here. Thank you, Blake. Um, thanks for having me and asking me all these hopefully interesting questions. <laughs> yeah, when I so for all of you out there, the way uh, the Duke Forest receives uh, research requests, often we'll be talking to researchers ahead of time. Um, and, and then at some point, a researcher must submit a, um, a research re request and we all received them. And when I read this one, I was so excited because uh, we all love squirrels and we all have um, special relationships with them. Speaking of which, I have to probably say that word squirrel pretty quietly in my household because my dog, uh, my dog in the other room may go crazy. <laughs> yes, that is her word. That's her word. Uh, and she will run outside. So um, we're going to start with a few standard questions that we ask all of our researchers, and then we'll get to some of the questions that were submitted by some of our users or, or social media users. Um, so the first question is, what do you study generally and what is exciting about it to you? All right. Um, so as you already said, generally I'm interested in how um, animals respond physiologically and with their behavior to changes in the environment. And these changes can include natural changes, so variation in temperature or variation in food availability. But this can also include human-induced changes, such as, for example, for my PhD, I was working in South America with primates, and I studied how animals respond to fragmentation, hunting, and logging. So that's a human um, cause change. And then for my postdoc in South Africa, I worked on small rodents, as you mentioned, and I was more interested in how they respond to more natural variation. And now I'm really excited to work on urbanization and how animals respond to that. Mm -hmm. Because we do see um, that the rate of urbanization is actually accelerating. And more than 70% of the world's land surface has already been changed um, by human actions. And that shows us that really a lot of animals are um, faced with these changes and they have to, either they have to live with them and they live close, in close proximity to humans or um, they don't. And so I'm really interested in understanding how they respond to living in close proximity to humans and how they're affected by that. So whether they're negative effects on their health, for example, by eating food that we feed them on feeders or whether they're using trash cans and they're eating our unhealthy food and this has negative effects on their health because it can have negative effects on our health for example but i'm also interested in infectious diseases because a lot of um, animals live at high densities in urban areas and that might increase the likelihood that they get infected with um, diseases for example in many cities in, Euro in European, in many European cities, uh, red foxes live at high densities. And for example, this has been associated with an increase in tapeworm infections. Mm -hmm. So I'm um, looking at these aspects too. 
Mm -hmm. there's a there's a lot involved i mean as you're speaking i'm wondering well what even is urbanization uh there's so many components to it there's you mentioned proximity you mentioned uh you know habitat d density of of, of of individuals in a habitat um yeah in, uh, you mentioned encounters with human I, humans I, I assume all of that equals urbanization but um I'm going a little off script, but what is urbanization? Uh, when yeah, I think that's a very good, but also very difficult to answer question because there's a gradient. Mm -hmm. So if you look at New York City, it's very easy to say that it's an urban habitat, right? Sure. And it's very altered. It's, it doesn't look very natural. But then if you look at a park, that's also an urban area, but is the you know, there's a gradient from a natural forest to a city. And um, I think defining what exactly urbanization is, is really difficult. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So then, then my next question is, well, how do you study uh, responses in animals? What, what, is, what does one do to study squirrels? Is it observation? Is it tagging? Is it, well, how do you do it? Okay, so uh, for this study, I'm actually going to collect a lot of different types of data. So first off, I'm going to compare two populations. I want to compare the um, population in Duke Forest with squirrels that live on Duke campus. So okay. these are more the urban um, individuals that I'm looking at, and they're using the trash cans, and they're typically, not right now, but a lot of people on campus. Uh, right now, of course, everything is a bit different. Yeah. Um, and there are more people in Duke Forest than um, on the campus. That's true. Um, yeah, so <laughs> quite the opposite of what I was thinking of. Um, but anyway, I want to look at population densities, of course, um, compare that. Then I want to see whether, um, so I'm going to weigh individuals to trap them and see whether there are differences in body mass, in sex ratios, for example. So this is just a basic um, getting an idea of the populations. Then I want to um, measure the habitat, not habitat, home ranges. So I'm going to uh, fit some individuals with radio cars and then we're actually able to track them and take GPS points to see how large of an area they're using. Wow. Um, and we're also going to measure activity. So they're getting little accelerometers around the necks oh. and that measures how active they are and when they're active. Um, yeah, I think that's going to be fun. And we want to measure energy expenditure. That's going to give us an idea of how many calories they're using per day. But then one big aspect of the study is looking at health. So together with a veterinarian from NC State University, we're going to trap them and exercise them and, and take small blood samples. And these we're going to use to assess health. So it's very similar to what a vet might do um, when you take your, your dog or your cat. We're going to look at inflammatory responses and we're going to look at whether there are um, signs of dehydration, for example. We want to take urine samples and blood samples and look at um, heavy metal concentrations because we know uh, that's toxic for animals and for humans, of course. So we're interested to see whether there might be a difference in that. And we also want to look at infectious diseases, so salmonella and leptospirosis. And, um, to see wow, whether a, it's a lot. Yeah, I know. It's a, it's a lot. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of different things and it's, it seems to be a lot of different disciplines and perhaps that's what you mean by an eco-physiologist. It's someone who studies, um, a, a, you know, a lot of different things in the physiology. Yeah, it's also the interface of ecology, I guess, with physiology. And I'm really happy that Yvette, um is also excited about this project and she has a lot of input and she knows much more about you know health and then i do so i'm learning a lot from her too and it's a really um yeah it's a really nice project i think great and so uh generally where are you working in the duke forest and do you have a uh, a set uh place is it staked off is it um how do you determine the bounds of where you're studying and you know that sort of location and equipment so um, when I was planning this study, I looked at the different divisions of Duke Forest and I was looking at what's feasible for us. So what's not too far away from campus, but where 
um, I wanted a division where not many people are living around. So I'll pick the Korsjan division. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah. Um, and basically all I need really is some tomahawk traps that we're using to uh, trap squirrels and we're baiting them with peanut butter because they really like peanut butter. Um, so that's all I need on infrastructure. And the way I, so right now we're basically trying to figure out where to trap. Is that dog? Dogs in the background, I'm so sorry. So, right. um, so honestly, we just went out and we, we set out some traps far away from the next um, inhabited area. And we do see squirrels there, so we're just going to try our luck. And if we don't trap animals, we might try a different location. Because right now it's hard to spot their nests. Um, because, you know, of the dense vegetation, it makes it really hard. Um, so, yeah, we're just trying our luck. And the beginning is always a bit hard in, in you know, forests. But we're getting there. Great. Uh, well, in the last sort of pre-formatted question is why is your research important to, to your field or to the general public or to squirrels in general? Um, to squirrels in general, <laughs> let's see. And we'll find out a lot about their health and how living on campus and eating, you know, ice cream and pizza and all of this, how this affects their health. I think that's going to be interesting to see whether we see similar changes in their health that we see in people that eat un unhealthy, for example. Um, and then I think the aspect looking at infectious diseases and the ones where we pick there, so zoonotic diseases, similar to um, you know the occurring pandemic right now. The coronavirus is also zoonotic disease, so it can affect humans. And I think that might be interesting for the general public, whether we find that squirrels that live close to us have these um, bacteria or not. That seems really important. And uh, yeah, this is exciting. I'm excited to see the results of this. I think I'm the most excited to see if there happens to be a, a map that is, that is generated from the radio transmitter collars. <laughs> I would love to see what a squirrel does through its day. Uh, I, think, I, I think anybody would be interested in that because they are such uh, interesting creatures that have such a range of motions that they can do and they can jump from tree to tree and go all sorts of places and yet I've heard that they go back to the same spots and they bury their nuts everywhere but they know exactly where they are or many of them it's they're they're a curious creature so great yeah, I well, did, yeah. and they're fun to watch <laughs> they are so much fun to watch that is true um, so the first question uh, from that was submitted um, via email and social media is uh, where have you studied and what animals have you studied uh, before? Before, uh, so like I briefly mentioned, I used to work with primates in South America. So I worked with spider monkeys in Ecuador and that was a pristine rainforest. So, you know, beautiful, um, more or less untouched. And after that, I worked in Colombia, where um, I was interested in fragmentation. So I was working in very small fragments um, where people were hunting spider monkeys and eating them. And um, so I've really seen the big contrast there. And then I worked in South America, uh, no, sorry, in South Africa, um, in the semi-desert. So that was in a gigantic change from the tropical rainforest to to a semi-desert where it's hot and dry and I work with small rodents and I have to say that's also a lot of fun. For a long time I loved working with primates but um, there's a lot of things you can do better with small rodents I guess that you so you, you can there's a lot of data you can collect easier on small rodents than on primates. Well, what was the name of the rodent or rodents you were working with are they? Um, striped mice. Okay. And they're called striped mice because they have four stripes on their back. Oh, okay. Great. And uh, so you lived in South Africa for uh, a good period of time studying down there? Roughly four years. Oh, mm -hmm. great. Oh, wonderful. Um, so what types of responses did you study in those primates and what were the conditions that they were res responding to? You mentioned uh, habitat loss through deforestation and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Um, what, what did you see happen? in them? 
Okay, so what I what I did, I, I worked with two different species. One was the brown spider monkey and the other one the red hollow monkey. And they're very different. Um, so hollow monkeys you can find even in the tiniest forest fragment. They seem to be very resilient to fragmentation. And the spider monkeys, they're more, they're less resilient. Uh, so I picked these two species and I compared their stress response their physiological stress response. So um, in humans, you would say cortisol or corticosterone, and I measured that in feces. And um, I was interested to see whether uh, we would find that in large fragments, um, there's tr they have a lower stress response compared to very small fragments. And in neither of the species, I found that. So fragment size was not actually driving um, their physiological stress response. It was more whether or not people were hunting or logging in these ah. fragments. And I only found that for the spider monkey, but not for hollow monkeys. So this again shows us that they're probably more resilient or that there are other factors driving variation in their stress response. So it wasn't actually necessarily the, the, the reduction in habitat, but actually the, the confrontation with humans um, or the encounter itself, is that, am I reading that right? Yeah, at least for the spider monkeys. Mm -hmm. Okay. So being hunted by humans and um, when logging occurred in the fragments, that, that, that's what I found to explain most of the variation in uh -huh. stress as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. Um, and and in, the, in the mice, what sort of responses were you seeing in there? What were those conditions that they were experiencing? So there I wasn't really looking at um, Anthropogenic disturbances, it was more variation in ambient temperature because they live in a semi desert. So, it, in the dry season, it's very hot, food availability is very low. And in winter, um, they have a beautiful flower season. So, the entire desert kind of is colorful and flowers, and that's when they reproduce. So, I was interested in how they're um, changing their activity and their energy um, expenditure. So they're reducing the energy expenditure when it's hot, when there's little food. Um, they're also reducing their resting metabolic rate. Um, so it just shows us that they are reducing the amount of energy um, they're expending uh, in the dry season. I wish you could take a blood sample of me right now because my habitat has become so small in the, in the last few months. And, and I'm interested in what my stress response is right now because I, I think it went up for a while and now it's down, but there's a lot going on and it seems to be anthropogenic in origin, so. That's true. <laughs> yeah, that would be interesting probably, how people responded to the pandemic. Mm. Yeah, just the just the <clears throat> biological factors, I'm sure there's a lot going on. Um, so before we get into squirrels, because that seems to be a lot of the questions that were, that were asked, of course, um, you know, someone asked, uh, well, just, I'll skip to this one. What is your favorite animal that you worked with so far and why? Uh, that's hard. If you would have asked me five years ago, I would have said spider monkeys, mm -hmm. just because, I mean, there's so much fun to work with and they have flexible moving patterns. So one day you work with a group that consists of two individuals, the next day it's 10, and it's very flexible. Every day is different. And working in rainforest is just, it's yeah. Beautiful. Um, the but then have stolen your heart, haven't they? They have stolen my small mammals, I would say in general. <laughs> but squirrels, of course. I mean, they're um, they're so much fun. Yeah. But I, I'm, I wouldn't say I have a, a favorite one, honestly. Great. Um, well, what made you want to study? Uh, the person asked behavior changes or responses in animals in the first place. What was it that that drove you to that? I guess that might have started in 2007 when I went to Ecuador for the first time because back then I was working in a rescue center for animals and I really have seen animals being confiscated or there were pets from people and you could clearly see that they were affected in a way that was pretty negative for them and then after that I was working in, a, in the Amazon and in this pristine forest and you could just the contrast was so it was really striking and after that for my PhD I was working in these fragments so um, 
just seeing this contrast and of course I, w I could have seen that in Germany too but you're so used to that that I think I didn't really notice and then in a different country um, I think I just noticed the difference more and I was interested in how animals cope with that and I mean and now I'm pretty happy that I can do that in the place where I'm currently living uh, I don't have to travel abroad um, so well that, that's one of our um, selling points of the forest as a as a research site that's the place to site research is that we are we are located in an urban uh corridor and 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 we're so close to the university a lot of universities forests are 100 miles away or more and um we're, we're so glad you you and other duke professors get to work out there in the forest so um let's move to squirrels because there's there's a few questions on that uh mm -hmm. one of the first ones i uh, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in this as well, and I understand you're not a squirrel expert. Uh, so if, if these are not, um, you know, questions that you're comfortable answering, that's okay. Um, but do squirrels work together? Are they more likely to work together without humans around? This was from an eight-year-old who was sent in this question. I love, I love this question. Um, so I'm afraid and not, I, as far as I know, I don't think they're working together. Um, so they might, in winter when it's cold, sometimes they share a nest. I guess this could be working together because you're trying to keep your body temperature um, up. Um, and they might play together. But other than that, I don't, I'm not aware of um, them working together. Yeah, I mean, when you see squirrels, they seem to be um, kind of on their own or they're chasing or playing with each other, but usually they're on their own doing some task and then yeah. going back to a nest yeah, so as well. They're actually, they're, sorry, they're actually solitary living, unless you have a mother with her offspring. Um, other than that, they're solitary. So um, I'm afraid they're not really working together. No, that's okay. Well, that bring, makes me remember a question that was written, um, uh, I love this question. Why do we never see what looks like a baby squirrel? I see baby rabbits, baby opossum, baby birds, etc. around all the time and they are clearly young juveniles but I feel like I never see a squirrel small enough to make me think it's a young uh, or juvenile. Do you have a thought on that? Yeah and it's actually interesting because I think it's true um, and I think it's because they leave the nest or they start leaving the nest when they're three months old and that sounds pretty young, but for a squirrel, um, they already look like an adult, basically. They're just smaller. Mm -hmm. So if you see a young squirrel um, and you're not used to comparing them in size or whatever, you might just assume it's an adult unless you have a comparison. So you might see young ones, but you can't actually tell that they're young because they just look like adults, as far as I know. Okay, well, that's, yeah. Uh, I'm going to start looking and comparing sizes because I've got nothing better to do, apparently. Uh, how often do they have litters? Um, just by, sorry, just to the other question, the other day in Duke Forest, I think I saw for the first time young ones, but there were several of them together and there was an adult kind of in the vicinity. So we could tell they were smaller, but if I would have just seen one of them, I wouldn't, I would have thought, oh, that's small, but maybe I wouldn't have thought it's a young one. Uh. Okay. okay, and um, about the other question, they can have two litters per year. Um, so um, the first litter is usually born in February or March, and then depending on whether there's enough food available, um, they can have a second litter in July or August. And gestation is 44 days. Oh. And wow. then they, yeah, it's pretty fast, <laughs> I guess, compared to them. How many, do, how many is, do they typically have? So on average, they have two to four, but the range is up to eight um, per litter. Yeah. Great. Well, this is a question I love. It was my favorite one submitted uh, about that's related to your research. Um, there was a lot of questions about the squirrels in, in people's yards. Um, mm -hmm. And so this one, uh, but I think this one's somewhat related to your research. The squirrel in my urban yard seemed fat and sassy. I would, I would have thought that living in an urban setting was beneficial to them. I guess that is questioning what the word, what is beneficial. Um, your question suggests 
and I've given them a sort of a summary of your research, suggests that you expect negative results uh, of urbanization, of exposure to urbanization. Why is that? Note, I do have squirrel proof bird feeders and sloppy birds, so maybe they are benefiting from that. I'm thinking she does not have squirrel proof bird feeders. So, the, so do you understand the question? I, I kind of botched yeah, that. I think I understand it, yeah. Okay. Um, so, of course, living with humans can be beneficial, and especially if you if they're just feeding on on the seeds and nuts that we're providing, um, that's a high energy source, and that can be beneficial in a way that they they have a lot of energy available and they can get fat. Um, so that can be beneficial. But what I'm thinking of, or what I'm interested in, is more um, more human food, so highly processed food, if that makes sense. So uh, ice cream or waffles or Pizza, something like this they might be eating and I've seen quite a few squirrels eating um, trash on your campus so yeah. I'm really more interested in that and we know for it's unhealthy for humans so most likely well depending on how often they consume this kind of foods it might be unhealthy for them too right yeah. so the, the, then I guess squirrels that are um, doing living the good life on your bird feeder may be doing well um and and it may be beneficial to them but squirrels that are eating pizza um uh, may show higher inflammatory responses because it's highly processed food or something like that is something like that so i mean of course it would be interesting to take in a third population in a residential area and see um whether they show intermediate levels um mm -hmm. of inflammatory response or something like that um so that might be a next step. Right now it's more like a pilot study to see if all the data collection works and what we're finding. But later on, I think it would make sense to include more populations to see, um, get a better picture of what's really going on. Well, you know, I've, I've often thought when I'm walking around campus, um, <laughs> what the stress response really is in campus squirrels, because it seems like um, they are comfortable being pretty close to humans and they can be in a trash can and feel like confident little uh, rodents. And it seems like squirrels in the wild may be, uh, you know, more skittish around humans. And I'm interested in, you know, the variability of that, that stress response uh, seems, seems like there are different things they're, they're adapting to. So um, there have been actually a lot of studies that look at something called flight initiation distance. So how close you can go to an animal before it leaves. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty clear that animals, or many species at least, that they have a lower distance when they live in close proximity to humans. So that's what you're describing. You can go, yeah. you can go up to one meter to a squirrel and then it decides to run away. Whereas in Duke Forest, when you, you might be 10 meters away and they already... Um, run away right? yeah that, that's that's it i can put my hand in the trash can that one's in and uh doesn't do anything okay so uh is the squirrel population in the eastern u.s significantly higher than it was say 200 years ago i feel like we have an infinite supply of squirrels around here and it seems to me that it, it might not have been the state of things in a less human modified environment Fewer predators, uh, more forest edge habitat, or maybe there are always were and always will be tons of squirrels around here. Yeah, that's um, a good question. So, um, from what I know is that there used to be quite a few um, squirrels around in eastern, um, I almost said Africa, <laughs> in the eastern US. Um, but then in the 1800s, there was a lot of deforestation going on and a lot of farm building and um, a lot of changes actually in forested areas. And then they saw a huge drop in the population. So for example, cities like New York, they almost didn't have any squirrels left and they were actually relocating squirrels back into the areas. Um, and now, of course, there are loads of them again, but there was a time when they were quite rare, actually, in some areas. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. I like this question just because I've, I've had it before, too. Uh, I often see two squirrels chasing each other up and down uh, tulip poplars in my backyard. 
uh, they will circle the trunk in a mad dash after one another. Is this a mating ritual or two siblings playing? You know? Okay, yeah. Um, so there can be three reasons why they're chasing each other. Um, the short answer is fun, food, and mating. Um, so if you have two adults, um, it can be that they're trying to maintain or establish a social dominance hierarchy because they, they are solitary, but they show dominance um, they show a dominance hierarchy. So one individual is dominant over another, and that one over another one. And that's how um, often it's related to body mass. So the, the heavier one might be the one that's more dominant. And they're figuring that out when they're chasing each other. Um, if it's a male and a female during the mating season, it, it's related to mating. And the male chases the female and sniffs whether she's receptive or not. And um, but young squirrels are also seen to play, and then they also chase each other around the, the trunks. Cool. Sometimes it seems quite aggressive, and I, I imagine maybe when it's like that, it's it's uh, mating season. Um, so maybe just two more questions, and thank you so much for your time. Uh, this one uh, it had a, a long paragraph that went with it, so I'll just I'll just ask the question. In it, do squirrels eat the growing tips of tree branches, or what? Do, and what do they eat in in general? So in in general, they eat um, they eat nuts, they eat some fungi, they also eat some fruit, um, but they can also sometimes eat insects and small vertebrates. For example, they might eat some bird eggs um, or even young birds, no chicks. And if they eat the tips of branches, I'm not aware of. So I would think they probably eat. Um, did the person say what, what tree that was? Um, I see squirrels high up in my tulip poplar out on branches. I frequently see the tips of branches falling to the ground under them. Um, and many tulip poplar flowers. Um, and, and we see tulip poplar flowers all over the ground. So I think that they're just falling off. I think they actually eat the flowers. So oh, from what do. I've read, they do um, eat the flowers. Oh, wonderful. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. And then last question. Uh, I think I, I've certainly wanted to know this because we have a squirrel friend here who doesn't have a tail and we see this individual a couple times a year and we've seen him for the past five years or something. And it's always a celebration to see this individual and um, when when he or she is around. Um, the, the question is, what might be the uh, area occupied by one family or one individual? Um, and are they territorial in that we'd only see uh, members of, of one family in one place, at, like at our feeders? Or is this a lot of different squirrels we're seeing? Do they, are they moving through uh, mm -hmm. the environment? Um, I think that's a really good question and something we're also going to look at, but they're not territorial. So um, they have home ranges and there's a large overlap um, between the home ranges of different individuals. And you're, the ones you're going to see are probably different. So they don't belong to a family since they're solitary. And they're just um, showing overlap in their home range and then they all come to your feeder because it's you know, a lot of high energy food. Um, and the sizes, they range between half a hectare and 10 hectares, but typically it's more around five hectares. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so neighborhood is perfect. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, Dr. Rimbach, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Is there any, um, any squirrel knowledge you want to share with anyone else uh, <laughs> related to the squirrels in their backyard or, or otherwise? No, give me a year and then I hopefully have a lot of squirrel knowledge that I can share. With yeah, you. And, and, and what is the, the time range on, on your study? I know you're just getting, getting it going. Um, so right now we're just establishing um, where we can actually trap those squirrels in Duke Forest. And I hope once we can go back to Duke Forest, um, at Duke Campus, it's going to be much easier to trap them there because they're so habituated to humans. Mm -hmm. So the hard work is really going to be um, trapping them in the forest. And then hopefully in July, August, depending on how everything goes with the pandemic, 
we should start collecting data and you know trapping them, taking blood and all of that. And that's probably only going to take two months for the first um, pilot study, and then we're going to analyze the samples and see what we get. And is, has the pandemic really disrupted your plan? You know, there's not as much trash in the trash cans, or the squirrels still seeking food in that way. So I mean, it has disrupted data collection in a way that I'm right now not allowed to work on Duke campus. Sure. Yeah. So. First of all, there's that. And then second, yeah, um, I don't want to say I'm worried, but of course there are no students, nobody's on campus, there's no trash. Um, so it's, ba it's a bit of the opposite of what I wanted to look at. Although, I mean, I'm looking at also long-term effects. I hope that one or two months of not eating unhealthy food is not gonna change everything, but I don't know. And we don't know what's gonna happen until August, so maybe we're, Hopefully some people are back on campus, I hope. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So it might be interesting to, to repeat that again next year when things are not normal, but different from how they are right now. Yeah. Well, if people want to find out more about you and your work, uh, how can they do that? Do they go to the, the department website or look for a certain journal or anything like that? Um, you can follow me on Twitter. I sometimes tweet about my work, um, and then yeah, you can you can check the Duke, uh, Duke or Evolutionary Anthropology homepage, and there's the Ponce Lab, and there's some information about my work. There. Okay, and what's your Twitter handle? Ah, uh, that's a very good question. Okay. I think it's Rebecca Rimbach. I think it's Rebecca Rimbach. Okay. Is my name. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Rebecca, and thank you all out there for watching. This has been another video in our series called Ask a Scientist. If you learned something from this video, let us know in the comments below, and stay tuned to what we're doing at the Duke Forest Teaching and Research Laboratory by signing up for our newsletter and following us on social media. Uh, I hope everyone has a nice day, and may the forest be with you. <laughs> Thank you, Blake. It was fun talking about squirrels with you. Oh, yeah. I, I, I could talk about them all day.